Hello everyone, Harry here, welcome to Scrap Science. I'm really quite excited for our experiment today. Um, we've got in store for us some really quite genuinely exciting chemistry to demonstrate. Our goal, as it stands, is to separate and purify cobalt from lithium ion batteries. Originally the plan was to extract lithium, um, but that seemed a little bit harder than I was expecting, so we're now focusing on purifying cobalt. And I've got three videos on that topic so far um, that you should go and watch now if you haven't seen them, because we're going to be continuing that extraction today. Quick recap, we have painstakingly worked to dissolve up um, the electrode materials of around 160 watt hours of lithium ion battery. What this did was it gave us a pretty big mess of a solution full of lithium, aluminium, nickel, cobalt and manganese. And then we first separated out the manganese in solution by oxidizing it to manganese dioxide, which we have purified and extracted here. With a bit of trial and error, the next step was an electrolytic process for removing the rest of the transition metals. Specifically, those were cobalt and nickel, and we were able to slowly electroplate them onto our cathode in the cell to produce a metallic mixture of cobalt and nickel. The small sample that we made in the last video, about 10 grams of cobalt and nickel um, that we electroplated, is right here, and that's what we're going to be working with today. That electrolysis process is actually still going on. I'm still trying to remove the rest of the cobalt and nickel from our sample. You can see the cathode there, slowly electro-winning those metals. If we take the cathode out here, um, you can see I'm actually getting a lot better at plating out these metals, getting a much more metallic kind of product here instead of that black flaky stuff we were getting last time. Anyway, that's taking ages, and I'd really like to do a small-scale demonstration of the next step in the separation. So in this video, we're going to be using this 10 grams of cobalt-nickel mixture, and we're going to be trying to separate the cobalt and nickel from each other. Now, this might not be something familiar to a lot of people, but separating two transition metals can often be a really, really difficult task. It's not on the levels of witchcraft that is the separation of, like, the rare earth metals or something like that. But still, the transition metals often have very similar chemistries in terms of their precipitation behavior, solubilities, things like that. Even redox potentials are sometimes quite difficult to differentiate. And bar the use of really handy oxidation states as we did with the separation of manganese just before, or maybe reducing the precious metals out of solution as you would with gold, platinum or things like that, it really does require some quite complex and very interesting chemistry to get it done. In this case, I think I've got a pretty efficient method of separating cobalt and nickel, at least according to what I've read online, but we'll get into the details of the process later. For now, all we need to do is dissolve up our cobalt and nickel um, with some hydrochloric acid to get it all into solution. 100 milliliters of azeotropic hydrochloric acid should be enough to get all of this dissolved. Of course, cobalt and nickel are relatively unreactive metals, so um, dissolving them in hydrochloric acid will probably take quite some time, but I'm pretty patient, so I'm going to let this go for as long as it needs. Luckily, the metal is kind of finely divided from our electrolysis, so we've got a nice surface area to work with, speeding up the reaction. With a little bit of heating and a quick filtration, this is what we have now. This is our metals dissolved as chlorides in solution. You can see it's become a kind of reddish, pinkish, purplish solution. It would be really nice if we could use this solution directly for the next step, but I think it's best if we remove the excess hydrochloric acid. Now since hydrochloric acid is a volatile acid, um, that should be simple enough, we can just distill the acid off with my distillation apparatus that I've got set up. It would be really nice if we had like a rotovap or something. Um, not that boiling hydrochloric acid is good for a rotovap, but it would be nice. Anyway, we'll boil off all of the excess water and hydrochloric acid, and hopefully we'll be left with some solid chloride salts to work with. Now that the distillation has started up, one of the cool things about cobalt chloride is something that you can see happening right now. 
if you heat up a solution of cobalt chloride that has just a little bit of excess chloride ions in there, the solution completely changes color. And you can see that right here, we have now a very, very blue solution instead of that purplish pink that we had before. The reason for that is the fact that cobalt um, with chloride ions can form a tetrachloride cobalt complex. And the formation of this complex is favored at high temperatures, hence why we're getting this chloride complex forming at boiling temperatures, whereas the cobalt remains in the hexa-aqua complex state um, at room temperature. And here we go. After boiling off all of the water and hydrochloric acid, this is our 19.9 grams of cobalt and nickel chloride product. It's a bit of a mess in here. We've got a whole bunch of different colors in the flask. We've got this kind of greenish blue stuff, this blue stuff, and then this purple stuff, probably different levels of hydration of the salts. But regardless, hydration doesn't really matter for the next step. Um, the important thing is we've removed the majority or the vast majority of the hydrochloric acid. So we're good to move on to the next step, um, which is where things get quite interesting. The first thing I'm gonna do here is dissolve back up all of our chlorides into some water, about 50 milliliters. And then with everything almost dissolved once more, you can see the return of that reddish, pinkish, purplish solution. To actually demonstrate to you the separations of the two metals that we have in solution now, um, I'm gonna start on a really small scale. So I have here a little bit more than one milliliter of our chloride solution of the cobalt and nickel, and I'm gonna dilute that into around 50 milliliters of water. With this solution, I'm gonna go ahead and pour it into my separatory funnel here, ready for the actual separation. Now with the camera repositioned, you can see our cobalt and nickel solution is sitting in our separatory funnel right there. It's got a nice pink color from the low concentration of cobalt that we have there. If we had enough nickel in solution, um, we would have a bit more green to this coloration, but we've got much more cobalt than we have nickel, so cobalt dominates the color. Additionally, I've also put in a bunch of butanone into our solution. Um, we extracted this butanone in another video, and being insoluble in water, the butanone has formed a clear layer on the top that hasn't dissolved any of our transition metals from the original solution. Before we do the last step in separating the two metals, um, we're gonna need to explain some chemistry so that we actually know what's going on. In this case, and in pretty much all cases where you have metals in solution, uh, metal ions don't exist as discrete species by themselves. Pretty much every time, metal ions, particularly transition metal ions, will always be in solution in the form of what we call complexes, where they are coordinated to other species. One of the most common coordination complexes that you'll kind of see in pretty much all of chemistry is a metal ion surrounded by six molecules of water. So your metal ion is forming coordination bonds with six water molecules. In fact, that's exactly what we're seeing here. We have cobalt mostly in solution here and each cobalt ion is surrounded by six water molecules. The color that you're actually seeing there in solution is only brought about by the fact that we have ligands surrounding the metal ions. Transition metal ions don't actually have a color by themselves and it's only with the addition of coordination bonds or ligands that we can actually force them to absorb light in the visible spectrum. The vast majority of inorganic chemistry, as a matter of fact, is not about manipulating directly um, the metal ions that are in solution, but it is instead about manipulating the ligands that are attached to them. There's a lot of really, really powerful chemistry that you can do um, with ligands and switching them out, putting the right ones on your metal centers. It's where all of the most interesting chemistry is. The whole switching out of ligands is actually the basis for the final step in this separation, and it's actually something we've seen before in this video. When we first dissolved the metals in acid and then heated up the solution, what we saw was the conversion of cobalt with six water molecules surrounding the metal center, or a hexa-aqua complex, 
to a state where we had the cobalt centres being surrounded by four chloride ions, or a tetrachloride complex. By switching out these ligands, we changed the geometry of the complex, we changed the colour of the solution, and we actually changed the overall chemistry of the system. With that brief introduction of what ligands and complexes are, in case you didn't know already, we can finally go on with adding the final thing to our separatory funnel and explain what's happening as we go. What we need to do is add just a little bit, about a gram, of sodium thiocyanate. I'm going to go and measure this out right now and add it, and we'll see what happens. Sodium thiocyanate going in. Oh yeah. That is what we wanted to see. All I'm going to do now is cap this funnel. I'll take it out and I'll slowly and carefully shake, vent and repeat. After shaking and venting and repeating that process a large number of times, I've allowed um, the separatory funnel to settle for a bit and once again we've achieved separation of the water and the butanone layers. But now um, our butanone layer is very coloured, it's very very dark blue, and our water is less coloured. It's kind of the same blue, but there's a lot less of it. What's happening here is, because we added thiocyanate ions to solution, cobalt centres are pretty happy to swap out their water ligands, or aqua ligands, with thiocyanate ligands to form what I assume is called a tetrathiocyanato complex. As it happens, Cobalt is a little bit happier than nickel to form tetrahedral complexes, which are complexes with four ligands. So cobalt is the only metal that should actually be forming this complex. And also, luckily for us, the newly formed cobalt complex is soluble in butanone. So what we should hopefully have done is converted all of our cobalt in solution into the tetrathiocyanato complex, and then we've selectively dissolved that into our butanone. It seems like there's a little bit of cobalt left in the aqueous solution, uh, but we should be able to remove that with a couple of washings of more butanone. Anyway, I'm going to separate the two components of this mixture, and then we'll see where we can go from there. Now sadly, I had to use up all of my butanone just to do this like one gram extraction, uh, but luckily we can recover the butanone after we're done. What we've got here is the separated solutions of cobalt and nickel. The cobalt is in this beaker here in the butanone solution. An interesting thing I'd like to note is this solution is a lot more colorful than our original kind of reddish pinkish solution. And that's because tetrahedral complexes so complexes with four ligands are much more colourful than octahedral, or complexes with six ligands. It's a little bit complicated why that's the case. It's mostly due to the fact that certain electron transitions are no longer forbidden when we have a tetrahedral complex. Now, while this explanation is technically correct, you might have a few questions. What are these electron transitions I'm talking about? And what are the electrons transitioning between? And why is colour even involved? To answer these questions, you're likely going to need an understanding of quantum mechanics, and that's exactly where this video's sponsor, Brilliant.org, can help you out. While learning topics like quantum mechanics, computer science, or astrophysics can definitely seem daunting at first, learning these things through Brilliant's online courses can make things a whole lot simpler. Not only do Brilliant's lessons explain these concepts to you, but they also incorporate interactive tasks and activities to ensure you come out of it with a proper understanding of the big picture. Whether you're learning a topic for the first time, or you're an expert wanting to keep your analytical skills sharp, Brilliant caters to your needs, and you're in full control over the learning pace. Seeing as we're on the topic of quantum mechanics right now, I decided to try out their course called Quantum Objects. To be honest, I'm very impressed with how comfortably the course leads you through some rather advanced concepts. Obtaining a high level understanding can be fun and achievable. To start working your own way towards your learning goals, and experience all that Brilliant has to offer for free for 30 days, you can visit brilliant.org slash scrap science, which I've also put down in the description. The first 200 people to click the link will get a full 20% off 
their annual premium subscription with Brilliant. Anyway, cobalt complex there and the small amount of barely visible nickel is in this solution. You can see the solution is kind of green and that is the color of the Hexa Aqua Nickel Complex. So I've got to first get my butanone back from this solution and then we've got to deal with the rest of these chlorides and separate them properly and then we might be able to see exactly how much cobalt and how much nickel we've got on hand. With a bit of trial and error I've found that we can extract um, the cobalt from the butanone layer by dumping the butanone into a solution of sodium carbonate. Um, when we do that, the cobalt precipitates as cobalt carbonate. You can see that as the kind of pinkish precipitate in there. And the butanone loses most of its color and it's ready to go for another extraction. With that all worked out, I think we're ready to do the full extraction on all of the cobalt from our original dissolved metals. I think we'll just add a little bit of thiocyanate at a time so that we're not doing everything at once. And as always, we'll cap it, shake and vent it, and repeat. We can barely even see the separation of the two layers there, but I think it's working. As I was saying before, if we pour this layer of butanone with the cobalt dissolved into it, into our solution of sodium carbonate. We should see most of everything completely dissolve. See it turn from the original blue color to now a very bright purple. Skipping forward quite a bit and I have completed the separation. After washing the solution with enough thiocyanate and butanone, um, we were able to extract all of the cobalt from solution which I have gone and precipitated as the carbonate as I was describing before. We haven't precipitated everything yet. Um, I've still got a bit of a solution here that is a little bit stubborn and doesn't really want to precipitate out as the carbonate, but I'll get there. For now, I've filtered off and separated a small portion of cobalt carbonate. I still need to wash it and dry it, but that is essentially the purified cobalt that we were able to get by this process. You'll notice as well, this solution, this is everything that didn't dissolve in the butanone after we added the thiocyanate. And as you'll note, it's a very green color. If we put that in front of a white background, um, that is a definite green coloration to the solution. And quite obviously, this is where our nickel is. There wasn't much nickel in comparison to the cobalt, but I would definitely say that the amount of nickel is not just trace amounts. Um, that is a significant quantity that we were able to separate. So it's a good thing that we did end up doing this separation. It might not be the perfect separation. We might have a little bit of nickel over in this precipitate over here and there might be some cobalt left behind in the original solution. But from the looks of things, it seems to have done its job pretty well. I'm honestly really happy that this experiment worked and I do hope that you found it interesting or at least somewhat entertaining to watch this video because I had a lot of fun doing it. There's something about purifying elements and seeing the colors separate from each other. It's real nice. Anyway, I think that kind of concludes the extraction of cobalt uh, from lithium ion batteries. We have the purified cobalt here and there's no reason to purify it any further. Maybe we could turn it into the metal again. I might decide to do that in the future. And of course, if I ever figure out where the lithium was in all of our solutions that we've made along the way, I will make a follow-up video and we'll see what happens there. But for now, we've extracted cobalt, we've extracted nickel, we've even gone and extracted the manganese. So I'm happy to leave it there. I do hope you tune in for the next video where we try out something interesting. But until then, I'll see you later.